we imagine why um, they're large um, and genomes undergo uh, large structural changes they have duplications rearrangements uh, deletions all sorts um, so to align entire genomes is quite tricky business um, but why why do you want to align genomes it's for the same reasons why you want to do any alignment um, as we'd covered in, in over the last in the rest the, the 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 whole morning is to understand the evolutionary history and the biology of species um, and to classify homologous um, relationships so uh, I really am no expert on whole genome alignment algorithms but I will share with you uh, like the surface of, of the you know the um, little bit um, of some, uh, some methods that are used in this in, in, in obtaining whole genome alignments. So basically whole genome align alignments um, abbreviated as WGAs here um, are we can represent them as um, as these uh, blocks alignment uh, um, as I can you see my pointer um, as 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 blocks um, blocks sorry um, and these are are segments of genomes that are homologous and collinear and by that uh, I mean by by collinearity I mean that they do not have any um, rearrangements or any breaks in the middle. So they are entire entire segments. You see, um, they are entire segments that are contiguous um, in a genome, uninterrupted um, segments uh, that um, can be identified in, in in a genome and that align to other genomes. So, for example, that can be represented here in in A. Here I'm showing. Um, uh, segments or blocks in three species, species A, B, C, and each uh, block is shown in a different color. And um, this, it, the bullet shape shows the direction of um, in which that uh, block is is present or occurring in that particular species. So, for example, all these blocks in species A are are forward facing. Um, this th these three blocks are reverse facing in species B. By reverse facing, I mean they um, they are uh, translated or they, they, they occur in the reverse um, complement orientation in that species at that locus. And then another way to visualize the blocks is here given in B um, is so now we're looking at individual blocks themselves and what we're noting here is in which species are they present so for example block w is present in a b and c x in um two variations of x, the duplication so there's two uh, in a one in B and one in C and so so on and so forth. And then these blocks are then ultimately underneath all that is um, what what makes these blocks are the nucleotide alignment. So here we're only at a whole genome alignment level, we align only um, nucleotides, not proteins. Um, so there's two major approaches. There are many others, but two major ones uh, of aligning, doing whole genome alignments. Uh, one is called hierarchical approach and another is called a local approach um, and, uh, and in hierarchical approach um, what uh, that does is it uh, um, that approach uh, breaks um, uh, breaks the problem into multiple global alignments first um, then it identifies high level collinear and homolog homologous segments of the genome um, and then does an, a nucleotide alignment on those segments okay whereas the local approach is kind of the inverse the local approach first does the nucleotide level alignment of the entire um, genome and then it filters and uh, filters the alignments in very, very various ways and merges them to produce um, produce sets of uh, of, of these um, segments homologous segments um, and there are there are lots of 
lots of tools out there that, that can do that. I've listed a few here. So um, an example of uh, um, examples of um, aligners that use hierarchical approach are MOVE, MUGSY, MGC, uh, GCAT. You may have used some of them. Um, and MUMA, a multi-Z, um, TBA, use the, the local approach. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to, to both um, the approaches, and I, I will not go into them, but both of the approaches rely on local alignment steps um, that look for all versus all uh, similarity, similar to um, what we just, uh, what BLAST uses. Uh, what we just discovered. So it, it identifies a seed and then um, and then extends that seed um, outwards in both the directions to um, to get a, a, a high scoring uh, pair or, or a local al alignment. Okay, so a little bit about MUMA, which is um, a tool that I really like using. Um, here, I, I, I there is a it's a uh, MUMA version three, but there there is actually a much more improved version MUMA four available. Um, and what this does, MUMA does a pairwise uh, pairwise alignment only, not a multiple sequence of multiple genome alignment. That is an even more complicated problem to solve. So MUMA does pairwise. Um, it uses uh, something called suffix arrays for indexing to speed up the uh, the, the searching um, or the alignment and uh, for the alignment process. Uh, it also offers parallelize parallelization, which enables which which makes the ca calculation or the, the, the computation of um, alignment computation even faster. And the new version now accepts um, uh, both faster and fast Q files as inputs. You hopefully have covered um, fast Q files in your previous module, module, right? The fast um, file format uh, module. So hopefully you're familiar with that. It gives a, along with a fast uh, and a nucleotide sequence, it gives a quality of that um, that base, right? Um, and in the output, what MAMA gives is a, is a file called Delta. It's got its own structure, but it's not um, it's not compatible with any programs other than other uh, programs that MAMA um, uh, has within them. So now what they have introduced is a SAM format, which then now can, you can now, um, loads, loads of um, other software can read SAM format and you can directly pipe your output of MAMA into other programs. But um, the downside is that MAMA is currently only command line based. It's not complicated command line based and if you um, were comfortable in your Linux module, uh, navigating around the command line, um, you'd be you'd easily be able to run Mama on um, on uh, on Linux. Um, and the other one now, Move is another one I have used uh, occasionally, and this one enables uh, multiple uh, genome alignments too. It is based on a progressive alignment. Um, is uh, a, a guide tree uh, to to make to do the alignment. Um, so it's a, it's a different way. It's it's a different way to do an alignment. A multiple, uh, uh, quite a few. So it you it, it relies on multiple sequence uh, aligners underneath, such as cluster W and uh, muscle, um, to build uh, the alignment at the whole genome level. Um, and it uses something called anchoring um, as a heuristic to speed alignment to speed the alignment, uh, um, and it's a different way of uh, doing it to um, uh, to MAMA. Um, and so, uh, what anchors are are are, are um, not inexact ungapped alignments found using the seed and extend method. Not so different from um, how uh, BLAST identifies its seeds. Um, so MOVE identifies and aligns regions of local collinearity um, that are free from rearrangement. So we, I described them before, they're like segments in a genome that are contiguous and not broken by any rearrangements. And they're called uh, LCBs or locally collinear blocks. And if you read more um, whole genome aligner literature, this is a term that is that comes up over and over again, L LCBs are locally collinear blocks because most algorithms um, rely on this uh, concept and, and identify these concepts. So MOVE is 
is available on command line and also via a GUI. Um, of course, you can do uh, just pairwise alignment on MOVE. Um, you don't need to do multiple, but it is also capable of doing multiple genome alignment, which is much more complex um, problem to solve. Um, <clears throat> oh, yeah, so this is just an illustra illustration of uh, locally collinear blocks. Um, each block is in a different color, just so you can see. Now, this is uh, this is a multiple genome alignment of um, how many are these? Eight, nine, uh, nine, nine genomes um, of E. coli and Shigella, um, and it shows how similar these genomes are between each other. Um, contiguous, um, so LCBs are in different colors, and the um, similarity between two genomes is shown in this very gr faint gray line. So you can see if there's a line, um, the line shows where, um, oh, sorry, something else happened. Uh, okay. So the line uh, shows um, which region in a genome. So for example, the top genome is similar to which region in the bottom genome. Um, the only, so th this illustration, for example, is a um, kind of a hierarchical uh, illustration. So you can, it only does, it, it only shows you the pairwise between the top and the bottom uh, alignment. Uh, pairwise alignment of between the top and the bottom, not if you want to compare this genome up here to this genome up here, you will have to recompute and realign and, um, and see where these, um, how these two genomes compare. So what these lines show is just, um, yeah, the comparison between uh, it, the genomes in its uh, directly above or below it. Um, okay, so when when you have made your alignments, no alignment is is perfect. In fact, no, um, well, nothing's perfect. Uh, so always, um, always, uh, there are ways to improve uh, whole genome alignments. Um, things that you could imp the alignments could improve on is um, where inversions occur for um, uh, within between genomes, um, where uh, the positioning of, of gene structures or coding structures um, or, or um, regulatory regions, etc. Those, those things can be improved and there are different tools that, that can do that on top of your alignment. So um, an aligner has to uh, balance speed and uh, speed with accuracy, sensitivity with specificity. So you won't get anything that fits everything, all the requirements. So always um, there is so there is always room so and there are always uh, shortcomings of a particular aligner so you need to be aware of those and then correct for those or improve on those um, as a second step. Um, this is my last slide. So why, how do you know that your whole genome alignment is um, is good between um, whether it's pairwise or multiple? There's <laughs> to gene um, orthology prediction. Um, so one way is to use simulated data and a lot of uh, aligners um, do the test on simulated data. Uh, this is simulated data are reliable because um, you you've simulated the entire evolutionary history of these of the data sets. So you know it's a you know the truth, you know the where they come from. So you can then um, check with your alignment whether that truth has been uh, realized or not. But simulation models may not be close to reality. So whatever simulation um, software are out there may not be able to capture all the variations um, of uh, rearrangements or in insertions, deletions, all the, all the things that are observed in genomes um, in nature, may, so simulation models may not be able to mimic that. So that that's why if you rely on simulated data, then you need to be aware of this particular shortcoming. The other way to do it is um, an, uh, is analysis of alignment to annotated regions. So 
genomes um, after being sequenced they are usually annotated and by that <clears throat> it, what we mean is that the gene uh, genes are identified uh, within a genome um, the uh, regulatory regions may be identified, um, the protein sequence may be identified, may be determined whether they are coding or not coding, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so if, you, if, if the, you have access to the annotation of a genome of interest, then you can use the annotated annotations, for example, the coding region, to um, and compare how the alignment of just those regions between your genomes, um, not the entire genome. That will give you a measure of confidence of, okay, whether, because that is a known, that the annotation is known, it's been tested, it may have been tested in the lab, um, there may be several homologues to it, um, if not at the whole genome level, but just that particular gene. So, um, um, so it, it is a good way um, uh, to check if your alignment has, is, um, is, has been done well. Um, similarly, you could look at the exons, uh, whether um, the order of the exons um, has been retained um, between, uh, between alignments. Um, uh, but, of course, there is always a but. Uh, the coding regions are conserved. Um, they tend to be conserved, okay, and that means that they would naturally be easier to align uh, than the tricky regions. So, what you would often find is that, okay, your alignment checks out because because it's just been um, easier to align. So in that case, what some people do is use ancestral repetitive elements. Repetitive elements are extremely difficult to align um, because because basically the aligner cannot decide where where that uh, element fits in. So, um, but if there is an ancestral repetitive element, um, uh, for example, some sort of a transposon that has been um, that has been acquired uh, uh, in 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 the one of the lineages uh, of the ancestors and it's been passed down, then you it's a repetitive element, but it occurs in in the lineage. So you could that could be used as a proxy to check whether. And you know that that's where it should occur in that locus, then you can check that uh, it has been aligned um, at that at the, at the expected position. Another way is uh, comparison with predictions from other methods. So you could rely on so not just whole genome, but the, but um, for example, use gene orthology prediction programs. Um, and they, the, the advantage of that is that they, those other uh, methods use different algorithms uh, for, um, so, so, so the biases may not be, be the same. So that could be a double, double check. But um, for example, orthology prediction programs, they can not be applied to non-coding regions. Non-coding regions are also difficult to align in cases because they tend to be quite variable. Um, and the other way to check is, uh, the other thing to look for always is the alignment statistics, um, example, um, the coverage uh, of, your, um, of your alignment. Um, so that's, that's all I have to say about whole genome alignment. Um, and are there any questions on any of the things we um, covered today? Um, local, global, uh, BLAST? Hi, um, it's good to meet you all. Finally, it's 5.30 in the morning. I had to wake up at four. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk to you about sequence assembly. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Why am I not? Okay, there it is. Okay, give me a moment.
Okay, I'll, I'll probably have to quit and reopen because something happened. I had to authenticate, authenticate Zoom to be able to uh, share my screen. So we are going to talk about um, sequence assembly and thanks to Michael for the introduction. So genome as sequencing and assembly. So you've talked about genome sequencing and what you can remember is that you had a pathogen that has this genome, could be DNA, RNA, which if it was RNA converted to DNA, then broken into smaller pieces. And then with these smaller pieces, post sequencing, you have these short reads of varied length. I mean, depending on what your sequencing strategy was, um, could be Illumina, uh, 150, 250, 300, or it could be uh, Oxford nanopore um, covering several KBs uh, or stretches of, of DNA. And then now what you want to do is go back to this initial um, genome or fragment of DNA that you're interested in. So by assembling these uh, shorter segments of, uh, of, of that fragment that you want to assemble. And essentially what normally happens or the overview or the workflow is that you have your reads and then you assemble this into uh, longer um, sequences that we often call contigs. And then you can join the contigs to form scaffolds and these scaffolds can uh, give you your genome. But I must also uh, highlight the fact that it might be that actually this stretch of DNA that you're trying to assemble is not necessarily the genome, but it could be a longer portion of the genome. So you can still have reads that you know are supposed to assemble a given portion of the genome rather than the whole genome. So this is essentially how people go through it. You start with your reads, go to contig, scaffold, and the genome, because um, often you ha we have assemblers that we use to um, get our contigs and there are also particular software that um, are specifically targeting the scaffolding step uh, to give you a final genome even though some are quite good that you can move essentially from the reads to the genome in the end so what is a sequence assembly so an assembly is a hierarchical data structure again you can see how hierarchical this is that's supposed to map the sequence data to a putative construction of the target. So the reason I've put putative in bold here is that whatever you get is really putative um, for the exact meaning of that word. It's, it's not final because a lot of times you can, um, and also in the sense that you, you never know that whatever you've assembled is actually the true genome or even the true segment of the genome that you actually you're, you're trying to assemble. And there are two ways you can go about this. So I've put classical sequence assembly essentially to mean to try and separate, um, uh, you know, it's still used though, like um, the older form of sequencing that uh, um, dideoxy Sanger sequencing that you would use before and the NGS uh, kind of sequencing that is uh, more uh, recently used. And the data format that you'd have for the sequence assembly is, remember you fragmented your genome, so you end up with these smaller pieces. And especially for the um, NGS, you're going to look at fast queue, but you might also, you might have like data in different formats. So whether ONT will give fast five, but you can convert this to fast queue, or you might have your data already in some compressed format. So it could be uh, an aligned sum or even an aligned bump that with which you can use to, to do your assembly. So this is essentially how your data should look like. So you have these fragments of DNA in a container or like a file, and then it's supposed to get you back to this genome. So this is sort of like highlighting what 
the assembly processes. So looking for overlaps between these sequences yeah, and contiguating them into this um, genome here. And if I give you like a real world example of what that is like, because sometimes the reads might be alien if you've never done some sequencing before. So think about this jumbled words here. That's essentially, you're supposed to align this into um, probably what, uh, hoping that you're actually having fun in the course of this uh, course. And it gives you a real picture of how things are so jumbled up here, like some words are only like a single uh, letter here. Some of them, it's, 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 it's not obvious how the pattern of these things should eventually end up into this um, clear and concise sentence. So that's essentially what uh, sequence assembly does. So um, if you've gone through this previously, and you've seen how first Q file looks, you have um, the header, you have the sequence, and then you have the line that um, describes the quality for each of uh, nucleotide in the sequence based on some ASCII coding. Um, so we'll go through a classical sequence assembly pipeline. So often with this, you have your reads, which can be in varied lengths, and here we always had like, um, you have a sequence that has a chromatogram. So you have those nice peaks um, that relate to the uh, fluorescence that comes from the, uh, this, the sequencing machine. Then you can read and trim. And this is, this like is often the, it's much easier than working with NGS data. You can easily see regions that um, look off, trim those or trim vector sequences, remove regions of low complexity or regions that seem the fluorescence doesn't seem quite right or um, regions that just seem uh, to have a lot of ambiguous calls. So these are non A, T, G and C. And then with these, you can just perform a multiple sequence alignment within the software and then um, finish the gaps using uh, a variety of experimental procedures. I think uh, we might highlight a few of these uh, using the NGS example, but they're applicable here as well. So this is quite straightforward and it's quite easy. Uh, even though for the practical um, exercise that we'll go through will be based on the NGS method. So you have sequences with chromatograms, but here the chromatograms are not shown. And with the Senga method, often these sequences are much longer. And also it's easier to find the overlap between them and then you end up with your final sequence. But to the NGS as I've highlighted is that the main problem is that these are much shorter reads and um, they are not ordered in any way. So it's difficult to, especially if you think about, you have something that's 350 bases and you're trying to find its correct position. In, let's say something that has um, 300,000 or 3 billion bases, something like that. And then if you think about the process of sequencing itself, it, there's also, there are also errors in that process. So, um, if you're trying to match or find out whether uh, a given nucleotide is not matching to, let's say you're doing a reference-based assembly, something we'll get into shortly, or even two reads are not correctly matching to assemble uh, into uh, one bigger stretch of, of DNA, whether that difference in that nucleotide could have been a result of a sequencing error or it's actually a valid sequence polymorphism, which means that that pathogen has that particular polymorphism at that position for some of the population of uh, that pathogen from that sample that you sequenced. The other thing to think about is repetitive regions. So if you have, let's say a region that has GAAT, or like it could be a region that has um, a duplicate that covers the whole stretch of the length of the read that you've sequenced, and they're in multiple positions across the genome. You wouldn't know whether you, you'd want to place the read at uh, one of these um, 
uh, repetitive regions. So whether it's assuming that you have like a, a triplicate of that in different parts of the region. One starts at position 30 to let's say 40, another one starts from position uh, 31,140 to 31,150. So if you're trying to put these reads, you don't know whether you would put this read in the first uh, repetition or in the second one, so things like that. And the other thing you have to think about is the non-uniform coverage. So if you've gone through the sequencing um, session, you'd see that people always do this tiled um, sequencing. And it's with the hope that eventually when you get your sequencing reads that they map uniformly across the genome. But sometimes that, or not even sometimes, always that doesn't happen like that. You always find that maybe a given segment of, um, of your genome sequence is more successfully than another region. So that non-uniform coverage means that it also becomes difficult assembling uh, or trying to get a full uh, assembly of uh, the genome or the genome fragment that you're trying to assemble. Then things like composition of bi biases. So to do with whether your genome is AT rich uh, or GC rich and things like that can also affect both the assembly, both the sequencing process as well as the assembly. So these are all the challenges that one should be aware of as you plan to um, do your sequence assembly. So there are two classes, uh, even though he have listed a third one. So the first one is doing uh, an alignment based mapping. So in this case, you have a reference with which you're going to use to, to do your assembly. So think of it as a map. So you have this reference and then you're saying that I'm trying to find positions with which my sequence reads map onto the given reference that you have. And the other alternative, you don't have a reference. So you're trying to do a de novo assembly and the kind of matching that you're going to do is amongst the reads themselves. So you have nothing like a guide or a map to uh, put the reads to as you try to assemble the whole genome or the genome fragment. You can also use a hybrid approach where, um, for example, you can filter out reads that only map to your reference, for example, and then use those reads to do a de novo assembly, or you can do a de novo assembly and then from your assembled sequence, for example, uh, from your de novo assembly, you can try map this onto a given reference, let's say, for example, in the scaffolding step. So a hybrid approach sometimes is helpful, also assessing how um, good or terrible your assembly is. And we'll see um, how both uh, classes of assembly are actually good and in what ways they can also be biasing your assembly. So if you think about um, the reference based assembly, so what I've just highlighted, so here I've tried to uh, color the, the reads and I'm sure you went through, um, you're told that there are two sets so sequencing, especially the NGS that you can do, you can have a paired read kind of sequencing or an unpaired read. So in my case, I'm, I'm using an illustration that has paired and read sequencing. So you have two sets of reads that are paired and they're color coded by the same color. And you have a reference here. So the one that's uh, in the uh, blue rectangle and we are trying to map these individual reads to this reference. And um, this is of course, having done your quality checks and everything is, is, is good. But then you also have to think about that the process of mapping these reads is similar to, um, actually they hold the same principles to what Sonal was just talking about because they are, they are metrics that the software that you're using to do your assembly has to um, uh, be guided by. For example, are you using a 100% match? For example, whereby you'll only map, for example, this read if it matches the reference at 100%, or 
or are you giving some room that, okay, I can allow up to 20% mismatch, for example. And where is that mismatch allowed? Is it allowed like in the middle of the, uh, of the sequence or is it at the flanks of the sequence? So saying that, okay, I, I normally expect during the sequencing process, the error rates are usually much higher towards the end. So I will not allow mismatches in the middle, but I'll allow mismatches at the end or I'll allow mismatches at any position within the read as long as it does not surpass a given threshold. So again, these are given settings that um, you'll give your assembly software. But this is the basic principle. So you have a reference and then you map these reads to that particular reference. And these methods, um, of course, as I've said, they're suitable for a case where you have a reference. And it's usually a bit much faster because it's easier to map uh, your reads to something that is already existing. And they often use this Barrows Wheeler indexing um, method. And the kind of software that we have, I've just given a few examples. So you have BWA, you have Botai2, and you have this Sopaliner. So essentially, first you build this index, which again, so you have um, your reference broken up into small chunks given a specific KMA or um, uh, fragment of given size. And then what you're trying to do is uh, to match your short read against this index that you've generated from your reference. And um, so you'll hear of Barrows Wheeler transform. So instead of, uh, so if you, if, if you look through the algorithm itself or you even look at what you have at the end here, you can sort of see that it's trying to match from actually this end going the other way. And that's where the transform, the Barrows Wheeler transform actually comes in is that once the matching has been done, it's eventually transformed to be actually reading the same direction as the reference. So um, these are the software that, example software that we use for the reference-based assembly. And in the tutorial this afternoon, you're going to use Botai2. Um, a few caveats. So when you want to map your reads to a given reference, it requires that your genome or your reads have to have the same genome structure as the reads that you're trying to map. So hopefully you don't have a situation whereby like there's an inversion, for example, uh, I don't know how well you can see this image, but you're, essentially what you're saying here is that if your genome is reading that way, you're hoping that also your reads are reading in the same direction. So you don't have some particular segments of the reference that are reading in a different direction. Um, even though it's, it's usually possible that, you know, uh, most of these assemblers can map reads in both directions. So it's never usually a problem, but sometimes it can also get quite complicated if there are such differences. But remember also such differences could also arise as a function of the evolutionary process of the pathogen itself. So the reference that you might be using might, might be quite different from the pathogen that actually been sequenced. So you end up with your reads not matching to the reference, not because um, it's just that you, you sort of have two different populations. So the way you have to think about it is that the pathogen has moved on, uh, probably has undergone some um, recombination or uh, reassortment or some form of, you know, um, genomic uh, restructuring that makes uh, the reference no longer suitable for the kind of reads that you want to map onto it. Um, so definitely things like repeats or transversions can affect mapping. Even though uh, the paired end read sequencing does help because there's the expectation that if I have this read here and I have the paired read with it, and I know precisely the gap between the two reads, then it can help you how to position uh, both reads onto the reference. 
Now onto the de novo, this is slightly different. I mean, uh, you don't have a reference in this case or you don't want to use a reference. And it could be that you don't want to use a reference because you don't want to have a bias assembly um, or because you suspect that the current pathogen that you're sequencing is slightly or quite different from the references that are out there. And it uses this De Bruyne graph strategies, a strategy with, uh, with KMAS. So um, if you, you might be, uh, have been exposed to it's a concept of nodes and edges. So it tries to align, I don't know if I have an image. Okay, I didn't put the image of, of, of the brain graph here. Um, but think of it that rather than, I'll just go back, rather than mapping these reads to this particular reference here that's in this blue rectangle, you're trying to um, find matches between the reads themselves. And because it uses also the KMA strategy, think of it that this read, even if it's like, I don't know how many this is on this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, it's broken up, it's broken down to uh, even shorter reads of given length. So let's say we have a KMA of three or even four. Then what it tries to do is that think of it as CTA, T, C, G, G, A, triple A. So you have a KMA that's CTAT. So you're going with a KMA size of four. And then you have another one of TATC, and then you have ATCG. So all this are uh, indexed for each of those reads. And then what you try to do is find matches for those particular KMAs, and you're matching against all the different reads. And then that's how you find the overlap. So once you match a given KMA from a particular read, then you try if the extension also matches the other parts of the other read for which that particular came are matched. That makes sense. So um, because the graphs can be quite big, remember that it's, it's not as simple as like you have a reference and I'm just trying to map it to this constant thing. Remember, you're trying to match all these different thousands of reads that you have. Actually, in most cases, you have millions of reads for a given file or several hundreds of thousands of reads. And then the several hundred thousands of reads are then broken down even to shorter KMAs with which you're trying to find uh, sort of like a local, uh, you've gone through the uh, blast and you've, uh, you've been taught about like trying to find local matches. So the difference between global and local matches. So you're trying to find these local matches between the different reads. And that can make the process um, quite uh, memory intensive. And um, you'll see that if you uh, do an alignment that either using, for example, Bowtie 2 or something like spades, this one would, would require significant amount of memory relative to the uh, reference-based mapping. So a few examples, you have velvet, you have all parts, you have spades. Um, and we'll go through um, why you might want to choose a particular sembra and not another one, uh, depending on um, for what kind of data set, for example, it was designed for in the first place. Um, so in the tutorial in the afternoon, Michael, are we using both velvet and spades or it will just spades? Oh, we only have a spade in the tutorial. It will be spades. But okay. We can provide links. Uh, okay. Yeah. So we'll use spades. That's cool. So why is de novo assembly necessary? So in this case, obviously you don't have a reference. So for example, if you think about the context of um, SARS-CoV-2, the current pandemic. You want to do assembly, you don't have any uh, SARS-CoV-2 genome that has ever been sequenced. I mean, right now there is the, the Wuhan reference that is used. You can use your assembly against that. Um, but then again, of course, uh, the caveat also would be that if you think about now we have all these different variants and they have diff this different uh, structural uh, mutations, the insertions, for example, in the spike protein that makes one variant different from another. You might not actually want to use a reference, 
or you might want to use a reference cautiously knowing that or oh, one has an insertion and you don't want to erroneously say that oh my sequence is an older variant while it might actually be a new variant it's just that the assembly restricted your reads to only the reference that's available so if your reference is considerably different or you suspect that it might be then you might want to do a de novo assembly rather than a reference based assembly uh, so it will give you an biased view of your genome and if you think about a pathogen population, so when you take a sample from an individual, it's usually not just a single pathogen in that sense, because you can assume that, think of it this way, that within that same individual, the pathogen, as, as the person is infected, the pathogen keeps um, multiplying and as it makes copies of itself, especially for viruses that I work with, it keeps making these uh, errors and then sort of you have um, this cocktail of different pathogens, so that are slightly different. So if you do a de novo assembly, eventually what you end up with is like you can have multiple genomes, which means it can account for the variation that is inherently existent in that one single sample. But if you're going to do a reference-based assembly, what you're going to end up with is a single genome. So you might not end up with multiple genomes that represents a population that is in that sample. Again, um, whether you use a reference-based assembly or a de novo assembly depends on the question that you want to answer and also how well you know your genome, right? So the hybrid approach, of course, you can align the reads if you can to a reference or you can just simply use the reference to, um, I'll give a practical example. You can use the reference to filter out the reads that are not targeted to your pathogen of interest. So always when you do your sequencing, let's say, even if your pathogen was SARS-CoV-2, in those sequencing reads that you get off the machine, remember at some point, maybe you, you breathed into your sample and then of course you shed your human genome in there. And in the sequencing process, you'll end up also with human reads in there. And that means you don't want that during your assembly process, you have this significant proportion of reads that are mapping to the human genome and you're trying to do an assembly with those particular reads. So you can use a SARS-CoV-2 reference genome that is available to filter anything that does not map onto that with some, you know, you could say like, okay, if even 30% uh, of my read does not map into it, which is what you'd expect with probably like human reads, then you filter them out. But then having filtered out those reads that are not for your pathogen of interest, then you can now use those specific reads to do a de novo assembly. Or you can do a de novo assembly and you have your quantics and then probably use uh, a reference to do the scaffolding step. So it's a hybrid approach that you know, uh, tries to have the best of both worlds. So to choose your assembler, one, it's dependent on how big your genome is. So obviously some of the assemblers are actually tuned to work best on large uh, genomes. Some are well tuned to work on smaller genomes. So if you take one that has been optimized to work on, let's say small, um, viral genomes that are usually less than an MB, and you want to do that on, let's say, a human genome that's 3 billion bases, and then def definitely your assembler is going to struggle. How repetitive your, your genome is, uh, like are they short repeats, long repeats, uh, are even the repeats known in the first place, um, depends again on how. Um, whether your assembler is repeat aware. So there are assemblers that are aware of repetitions or they take care of the fact that there might be repeats across the genome. So for example, if it finds that your particular read maps to multiple positions across the genome, is it going to do a greedy approach where it lumps all the reads to this first segment to which the read maps? Or is it going to try and use, for example, overlaps with the non-repetitive regions to map 
the reads to the different positions at which they are repeated, something like that. So again, like I said, most assemblers are fine-tuned for a specific task. So some are for big mammalian genomes, some are for small genomes, some are for single cell assembly. Um, but this might be a classification. So for example, um, spades nowadays is used a lot even for the smaller genomes as well. Um, some are specifically targeting transcripts, so RNA-seq data rather than um, uh, kind of uh, DNA data. So you might definitely want to use a specific assembler based on the data um, or the task that you want to perform. Because you might just end up with the wrong assembly using the wrong assembler. Again, I'll show you a practical example of how that is or a real world example of uh, um, what happened with my own data set. Um, the other place you could go to are these public benchmarks. So probably the last assemblathon that was done, if somebody knows whether any has been done after 2012, they can let me know. So the assemblathon is, um, was sort of like where um, different groups would come with different assemblers and you'd be given specific genomes. And then they would want to compare the best assembler for that particular data set. And then all the assemblers would be ranked. And if you go to this website, you can find uh, there was an assembler on one, two, and I think a third one. And they list the best assembler for each of those data sets. So they would have, for example, a fungi data set, they would have a viral data set, they would have a bacterial data set. And you'll see definitely that. Um, the best assembler, for example, with a fungi uh, data set is not necessarily the best assembler when you look at a bacterial data set. So gauge is specifically uh, comparing uh, bacterial assemblers. And then um, also you have the nucleotide.es. This is much more recent. Uh, the assembler on the website actually might be actually outdated. Um, so I would actually trust this latter too. Um, so setting up a coverage for what you expect is also a good target. So um, how many times? So if you think about the reads mapping to your, if I might just go back a little bit. So if we look at this position T here, we might say the coverage here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like seven times that base. So you might have a metric that represents um, the coverage averagely across the genome. So the genome is covered like, if you say 50 times, it's that. Even though I must cautiously warn you that the term coverage people use it sometimes loosely because in some sense it's also used, uh, some people fail to say genome coverage rather than nucleotide coverage. So genome coverage means what proportion of the genome has actually been assembled. So the other thing um, that you'll take into consideration as you choose your assembler will be your computer hardware. So whether you're doing this on a remote server or on your laptop, what the memory um, that's available to that laptop is, and how many CPUs, for example. So some are actually memory hogs, or let me say they require lots of memory to do. So you will not want to um, choose a, an assembler that requires lots of memory, yet the memory that's available to you, for example, on your laptop is quite limited. Again, thinking about uh, the overview, you have your reads that you get to context, scaffolds, and then the genome. So um, this is uh, an output from Quest. So Quest is um, software that you can use to compare your assembly output. So think of it, uh, this way you have different assemblers, you've assembled the same genome, and you're trying to find out which of these assemblers is giving you the best genome. And then what Quast will do is that it will take the output from the different assemblies and it will, sorry, excuse me, it will compute different metrics. So for example, 
how many contigs were assembled from your read. So how many of these? So if you think about it, you want an assembler that gives you the fewest contigs, which means that it's, a, it's able to assemble the shorter reads into much uh, longer stretches of um, DNA. So you have fewer contigs. So you can see here that the assembler here that has the fewest contigs is IDBA hyphen UD. And you also want the, uh, that the longest, I don't know if I remember this correctly, that the reads have this length that cover 50% of the length or longer, something like that. Um, the largest uh, base pair or the length, the, the assembler that gives you the longest contig. And this looks at the genome coverage. So uh, the total length of the genome that has been assembled, which correlates with the genome fraction. So you can see the one that actually gives you uh, the, long the longest genome fraction assembled is actually spades here. Then it also looks at the number of misassemblies. And I think in this case, usually you have to have like a given reference. So you can see that Velvet, despite having um, uh, a few more contigs compared to this assembler, for example, and also having like um, much shorter uh, contig lengths, um, you, you end up with fewer misassemblies. So, and if you have like your genome annotated with complete genes, you can be able to extract how many of those genes have been assembled completely. So you can decide um, whether it's the completeness of the genome that's important to you, or whether it's the length of the contigs, um, assembled contigs that's important for your specific analysis. So I would think uh, a real world example, if I'm dealing with a genome that has lots of sequencing repeats, I would rather go for an assembly that gives me longer context rather than just the completion of the fraction of the genome. Because you, you don't want your repeat regions to be mapped anywhere across the genome with uh, much shorter fragments. So what do you do after the assembly? I'm trying to, because it's, I think it's one already. Um, what do you want to do after your assembly? Of course, you want to do things like gene prediction on your assembled genome. You'd want to transfer annotations if you have a given reference, so you're transferring. Um, so once you've done your annotation, you want to transfer. Once you've done your gene prediction, you can transfer annotations from um, a related genome. You can do variant calling. Um, for example, if you've done the reference-based uh, mapping and you have your SAM or BAM file, you can do some phylogenetics or other fun stuff, depending on what, um, uh, for example, even differential gene expression, if you did that and things like that. So I want to quickly show you some real world problems. So the first bit we are going to look at are misassemblies. So, how well can you be able to see the names here? Michael? Uh, yeah. Uh, They're pretty small, okay? Yeah, but the lower one is okay. Below is okay. okay, but the Okay, so because I want to highlight that, so let me just, is that better? Yes. Okay. okay. So here I tried to assemble the same genome. So the, the, the sequence that we're looking at is this, this one here. So we have a reference. So it's KC731482. And I'm trying different assemblers. So there's Vaikuna, there's Masuka. And Masuka at that point was the best assembler, but it was more for the, um, the larger genomes. But I was trying it on a small uh, virus genome. Vicuna specifically was designed for viruses and of course spades that 
uh, was for single cell assembly. And then the additional thing that I, I did as well was to use um, this additional software that we normally use for the scaffolding step. So Abacus, SGA, Sopra, and S space. So um, the thing that I want to highlight here is that one assembler, it can perform quite well in one part of the genome, yet it can do terribly badly in a different part of the genome. So for example, this, this insertion that you see here is it's non-existent in our, in our sequences. And I know that with certainty. And if I just zoom back in, you can see that this was specific to the Masuka assembler, but it was not present for any of the Vicuna assemblers or with spades. Then you look at a different part of the genome now here. And then again, now you're seeing a different set of insertions. So this one here, these ones here. And in this occasion, actually the insertion is being put in there by this software now, by Kuna Maisuka now is doing, is doing pretty well for both of them. But then you can see Vaikuna is doing something totally uh, unexpected. So again, remember that um, one assembler can perform poorly in a given region and pretty well in another region. Again, going back to, um, what is the slide? Uh, so depending on how fine-tuned for a given task your assembler is or whether it's how it handles repetitive regions. And again, I'll show you an example of that. So you can remember that in this case, there's one software that never had issues in both alignments. And what software is that? If somebody can just unmute themselves and say what assembler that is. Anyone? Hello, did somebody type something? We are already hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see that in both cases, spades never had an issue in, 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 two, in two of these assemblies. So we are thinking here, I mean, spades is all right, it has no issues at all. So why don't we just go with spades then, right? Then you look at some of the other assemblers in particular regions, and then now, so these are assemblies by spades, and then now it has these spurious insertions that I know for certain are not supposed to be there. Or for example, in this case, so the signature for this particular sequence that, or this particular virus that I know is that it has this duplication here. So for some of the um, spades assemblies, it was not assembling that repeat region, okay? So again, knowing your assembler, is important and probably what I advocate for is not just a hybrid in terms of using both reference and de novo assembly, but also using a hybrid approach where you use multiple assemblers and then you come up with the best assembler for a given region. And you can, if you can look at these graphs, so if you'll keep note, you can see that at the top here, so this is uh, pointing to read coverage Again, you can see how um, varied the coverage is across the genome. Particular regions have very low coverage, particular regions have high coverage. And these are two, two different data sets. And it will surprise you that uh, um, for some of these, even though it has good coverage, the assembly wasn't that good. And for some of these, like these are two different sets of samples. One has very low coverage in particular regions, but it's able to, the assembler is able to assemble one and it's not able to assemble another. So if I just give you, uh, this is probably my actually second last slide. So in green here, so I have different columns. So one gives you the number of reads that you get from your sequencing machine. You can see there's most of them are like above a million reads. And then after doing QC, for example, the bit that you did with uh, Sean Aaron, you end up with a few um, fewer reads. So for example, here you have 
uh, a million, and then you get 900,000. And um, if you look at, in this case, a specific virus was RSV, if you look at the reads that are specific to your given pathogen of interest, you even see a much more significant reduction. So for example, here you have a million, 0.1 reads, and then your specific reads of interest are only like about half a million, so 51%. Um, so think of this scenario here. You have this sample here that has a million, 1.8 million reads, and actually 88% of those are RSV, but we could not get a, an assembly out of that particular uh, sample. And I don't know if I have sample 16 here. Hmm, no, I think maybe I want to highlight something different. So let me see, this is 27 and 41. Sorry, I thought I'd put that up, but um, so this can sometimes happen. It could just be that maybe the coverage is quite non-uniform across the genome that you don't end up with any assembly at all. Um, in some cases, you also do this, you have the situation whereby like you have hundreds of thousands of reads, but only for example, 459 actually of your pathogen of interest. Um, or you have, I think there was a case where you have very few reads, but still it was able to get an assembly. So do not just simply use a read, the number of reads as a cutoff for determining whether you should proceed with an assembly or not. Because you can see a sample that has 1.4 million reads is able to assemble just as well as a sample that has, let's say, um, I think I had one that had less than 10,000 and still was able to assemble, right? And if you look at my column here, the assembled, you can see that I eventually ended up using a combination of this assembler called Viral NGS and Space. So I was picking the best assembler for, for the particular sample of particular genome. So if the spades was the best for this particular sample, that was what I kept. Last, um, they say garbage in, garbage out. So uh, if you remember again, Sean Aaron's presentation, ensure that you have uh, quality reads because everything that you do at that stage affects everything downstream. So if you have um, garbage reads or reads that are not of good quality, uh, then you end up with terrible assembly. At the same time, also, if you have a terrible assembly, then everything else that you do downstream will also be uh, purely garbage or you'll make the wrong inferences in the ad. So, Last but not least, remember that sequencing assembly is not a trivial task. And sometimes it's not just your problem, it's just a complex thing and methods keep developing to optimize the assembly process. There is no single perfect assembler, test and pick different ones, and then know your genome really well, because this will help you one in picking the assembler and also knowing um, the expected misassemblies or when misassemblies exist. There might be a best assembler for a specific pathogen or group of pathogens, or whether they be bacteria or humans. And there are also particular best assemblers for particular data sets. So whether they are uh, sequences from uh, Illumina or Oxford Nanopore, they, you have different sets of assemblers. And, and remember that whatever you do downstream depends on that assembly. So ensure that it is done properly well. And that's it from me. Any questions?